Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. In the past few weeks I've been providing archaeological updates on the Tashtepela sites of Turkey. This is thanks to a presentation that was given by archaeologists in November 2022 on the Turkish language Archaeology Harbour YouTube channel. The presentation provided updates on the well-known sites of Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe, as well as Seybirch, Harbetsevan Tepesi, Sefer Tepe and Chakmak Tepe. But there was also another ancient site that was discussed, and this is not one of the 12 Tashtepela sites, and it's one you may never have heard of before. It's called Gercha Tepe, a late pre pottery Neolithic B site on the southeastern outskirts of Şanlıurfa in Turkey, and it consists of a number of shallow tells or mounds on a plain along the Siren stream that flows from Şanlıurfa. Due to the growth of Şanlıurfa in the past 30 years, modern buildings surround the site, and a lot of the actual site is also now built over. You wouldn't recognise this as an archaeological site of interest on first glance, but Gürtje Tepe is a place that should not be forgotten, especially with all of the new discoveries coming out of Turkey. And there have also been new excavations in 2021 and 2022. With all of the new discoveries in recent years in southeastern Anatolia, we need to really try and think big, to understand there is a bigger picture emerging. None of these sites should be thought of in isolation, and just because Gebekli Tepe is the most famous, we can't forget it's just one of dozens of sites in the Fertile Crescent that date to this remote period of time. So, as always, to start off this video, I plotted the site on Google Earth, and you can see its position in relation to the other pre-pottery Neolithic sites in the region. Gürtje Tepe comes right at the end of the pre-pottery Neolithic, and it is particularly important, as it may provide the answers as to why this period came to an end. Gürtje Tepe was first excavated in the 1990s, under the direction of the late great Klaus Schmidt, well known for his groundbreaking work at Gebekli Tepe, whose excavations began at the same time as Gürtje Tepe. Schmidt and his team carried out soundings on all of the artificial mounds and made extensive excavations on one of them. But when the work at Gebekli Tepe became more demanding, Gürtje Tepe was left. It was discovered that Gürtje Tepe was settled during the later part of the pre-pottery Neolithic B, and for reference, this period has a date range of 10,800 to 9,000 years ago. Gürtje Tepe was probably an active settlement as Gebekli Tepe was going out of use, or it could have arose after it was abandoned. You could say it's what happened after Gebekli Tepe. In the Archaeology Harbour YouTube presentation, Gürtje Tepe is first introduced in English by archaeologist Professor Barbara Helwing. Then, Assistant Professor Muchella Adelkaran presents information in Turkish regarding the excavations in 2021, before Professor Helwing ends the presentation by giving us an update on the excavations in 2022. Therefore, in this video, with the blessing of the brilliant Archaeology Harbour channel, I'll first be showing the site background and introduction by Professor Helwing, then, I'll be presenting the 2021 excavation information myself, and I'll do this the best I can, after spending a few days working to translate the YouTube generated Turkish transcript. Then, to end the video, I'll go back to Professor Helwing, who will explain the new findings from 2022. So, without further ado, here is Professor Helwing to tell us all about the amazing site of Gürtje Tepe. And uh, we will take you away from Tash Tepele and we'll take you to a place that consists mostly of soil. So we introduce tonight uh, the recently started collaboration project of Gürtje Tepe excavations 
We will talk about the two years that happened in collaboration between Mujella Erdal Keran from Ege University, myself uh, from the Berlin State Museums and in collaboration with Jean Lohofer Museum. Um, and before we really go into detail, I would like to take a short detour and remind us of where we are. And as you can see on this slide, we are in an area that has seen very dramatic changes over the last 50 years. So the earliest uh, satellite image I could find on Google on the left dates from 1986. And you see a rather dry landscape as to be expected in this area. And on the right, we see the modern landscape where the all of Haran plain is now irrigated and where the Atatürk Dam has flooded a huge part of the Euphrates Valley. And this flooding of the Euphrates Valley has led to the discovery of the place of Nevalajuri that today to probably everybody seems to be a household name in the archeology span of the Aceramic Neolithic, but then it was not. It was then the first place in this province uh, discovered and excavated at large scale. And um, this is due to a few people that I wanna really pay homage to. Um, the whole enterprise in Evalachori was directed by Harald Hauptmann, whom you see on this image in conversation with Mehmet Özdoğan, who has always been a great supporter. And then uh, Klaus Schmidt, whom you see on the left, who was mainly concerned with um, uh, studying the lithic inventory from Nevala Jury. This was really an, an initial part of really studying this period in the Urfa region. The site had been discovered um, in, the, in the late 80s, um, no, in the late 70s, actually, during survey was excavated in the 80s and was drowned in 1991. So if it hadn't been for this discovery of the first large place with such a, with such an, um, yeah, a cultic um, building, probably uh, Klaus Schmidt would not have been capable of making the connection with the other two sites that he subsequently excavated. And these were Göbekli Tepe, now UNESCO World Heritage Site, and Gürtü Tepe. Um, both sites, uh, so work in both sites started at the very same moment. And then when Göbekli Tepe picked up and became so, so demanding, Gürtü Tepe was left. Uh, Gürtü Tepe is located very close to the city of Urfa. And unlike all the other sites we've seen so far, it is located down in the plain and not on, um, on the hills surrounding it. On the right, you can see the extension of the site as it was, as it was preserved when work began on the site in 1995. And it consisted of eight individual smaller hills that were spread over uh, a distance of more than a kilometer in east-west direction. And this on the right is a well-known plan of the surface collection or surface survey results by Klaus Schmidt and his team. But the area has changed dramatically. And if you look at the left, which is the earliest visible or good, good satellite image we can see here, where Gürtü Tepe is right in the middle, you can still see from the structure of the gardens to the left, how this must have been located very close to a meandering river bed. And on the right, you see how the site now looked in 2020 and that the settlement of the modern uh, big city of Urfa has dramatically encroached on the site. And as a result of these eight hills that we had in 1995, there's only a minor part left. So we mapped here, this is uh, thanks to Jörg Becker who did this in preparation last year. Uh, we mapped here um, the results of Klaus Schmidt's uh, surface collection onto a modern satellite image. And you can see that out of the eight mounds, 
the larger part is now under modern construction. The two areas where um, the early excavations concentrated are the trenches in Gürtü Tepe 2 and Gürtü Tepe 3. Gürtü Tepe 2 is today not accessible really anymore. Gürtü Tepe 3 has one part left and this is where we will show you later. This is where we concentrated our work. Um, but I want to also just introduce some of the results of these early works because um, it helps us to locate our current work. So, Gürtü Tepe 2 was excavated um, over several seasons in the late 90s and it was located along an erosion gully leading to the northern, uh, the northern slope of Mount Number 2. And in here, the team discovered three distinct buildings that are labeled here, number one, number three, number two. And on the right, here you can see house number one. On the left, you can see a close-up of house number three. House number two was a small um, rammed earth uh, corner of a building. And these three, um, these three constitute the upper layer of um, the deposits in Gertrude Tepe too. And as you can see on the left, we have here a stone built construction. There were two standing stones that uh, in German were labeled autostats and that were immediately brought in connection with what we knew from, um, from Nevala Chori about the standing stones all around the buildings. So this building was immediately considered to be of some major importance. And from the finds that were collected, um, we have um, a sort of development out of the very well-established type of the Byblos points that Klaus Schmidt decided to call Palmyra points. They have a burin, a burin um, napping at, at their bases, so they are slightly different. And he also uncovered one small figurine um, of a type with a, with a flat, disc-shaped uh, face of a type that we also find further down the Balich Valley. And what you can see in the middle on the plan is that underneath these three houses that um, are here detailed, there is a much smaller and more detailed occupation in the lower level here called houses four to seven. And uh, they have very small rooms, tiny compartments, and none of them appears complete. So this was Gertrude Tepe 2. Gertrude Tepe 3 um, also had architecture and this architecture consisted of PZ or rammed earth. It was only discovered in a sounding of four by four meters, so it's pretty small still. And um, But from this sounding, we know that Gertrude Tepe 3 has a maximum of deposits of some four meters to be expected. And in this, we will see and this is what is also reported from this first sounding. There will be dense layers of trample surfaces, of floors, of um, lenses, of all kinds of ash layers, etc. So we can expect, and this is good for us, that we can immediately consider to plan for an excavation that has a rather detailed and condensed stratigraphy. So this provided some good orientation for our work. And with this background knowledge, then it was decided to go back to Gürtü Tepe and to try this time um, to spend more time on the site. Um, this is how the site looks today. And I wish to especially thank uh, Nechmi Karul and also his, his team who took aerial photography, photographs of the site. Um, and you can see here that this is just one slice of the mound number three that is left. And you see how the big city and all the paraphernalia of the big city are here encroaching onto what's left of Gürtü Tepe three. And at the end of the 2022 season, this is what our excavations looked like. And from here on, Michelle Adal-Kiran will take over and introduce the work that 
she conducted by herself with her team in 2021 because the German team did not get any permission to travel during the pandemic. And then I will later on come back to the results of the 2022 season. Please, Michella. So, with no disrespect to Michella, I'll now try and talk us through the results and findings from 2021. Apologies if I get anything wrong, but I did find it very difficult to translate Turkish with the tools available. In 2021, excavations took place at the area of the site known as Gürçetepe 3, an area that today is used as a field. Work started on trenches K9 and K10, but due to the intensive farming, the archaeology was not in the best state of preservation. Also, due to modern building work, a lot of the ancient stones have been cleared from the site. An irrigation canal was also put through the site, and this destroyed much of the archaeology. The archaeologists did find the remains of walls and foundations, and some of them were made from big stones, indicating that these were strong walls, possibly from large structures with big rooms. There were also some pits discovered, and a number of stone artefacts were also found. Artefacts include flint tools and stone axes, one of which was made from serpentine. Bone fragments were also discovered. One of the most important finds of 2021 was this limestone human figurine. It's in a sitting position, and you can see the arms etched onto the sides. We can also see part of a leg, but it's not detailed enough to say a lot more. The object could have been worn and eroded, or maybe it was simply incomplete. There was also this animal figurine that was made from unburnt clay, and a fragment of a statuette that was made from alabaster. There was also an oval vessel, and three quarters of it was still in good condition. Archaeologists found marble bracelets, bowls and beads, some of which did look quite special, including this one here that's made from serpentine. Underneath squares K9 and K10, older archaeological layers are present, and these were looked at the following year in 2022, and Professor Helwing will discuss the findings at the end of this video. To the northeast of the squares we've just looked at, older surveys showed there was a large building in this area. And thankfully, in the first excavation trench that was opened, known as Square J8, the archaeology was below the disturbed soil. In the trench, three walls were uncovered, and there was also this fantastic find. This is a full-bodied female figurine that's made from limestone, and it's uncommon to find such an artefact in southeastern Anatolia. It's more like the Neolithic female figurines that are found in central Anatolia, such as this one that was found at the later site of Chatelhoyuk. Inside the stone structure, flint tools, flakes, stone axes and discs were discovered. Outside the building and the area was an open space, and there was also an ancient workshop. Many fire pits and also a garbage pit were discovered. There was a large amount of flint and bone artefacts, and burnt bones were also found in cooking areas where hearths have been identified. Further finds include fragments of female figurines, and some of them display traces of ochre. A number of objects appear to have been brought in from far away, some of which are very reminiscent to what we find in Jordan. These objects are thought to be fishing weights, and some of them were even found to be painted red, and this is just one of a number of stone plates discovered. An adjacent trench was then dug, known as I-8, to try and see the extent of this building. But modern farming had disrupted the archaeology, with stones moved from the site and piled up, making them very much out of context. But lots more artefacts were uncovered, more stone axes, fishing weights and very carefully crafted beads, 
including this one that's made from green stone. This bead is broken, but it would have displayed four holes opposite one another. This is similar to other examples that have been found at Sefer Tepe, the subject of my last video. Bone tools were also found, an example of which is shown here. This object was carefully crafted and obviously made with care and love, but what it is, well, it's open to debate. So, that's a brief roundup of the excavations from 2021, and now back to Professor Hellwing, who can tell us all about the latest excavations from 2022, where she takes a look at the older layers in squares K9 and K10. And um, I now take up from the moment that uh, Mugella's team uh, had prepared uh, the two southern squares, uh, K9 and K10, and when the German team finally could arrive this year, um, we began by documenting everything that was uh, standing from last year. And then we uh, concentrated on digging further down according to the stratigraphy we were expecting. So we were looking at these two trenches, these two squares, K9 and K10. And as Michela Hodger has uh, explained before, in the eastern part, so in, in the lower right picture, this would be the upper part, uh, there was quite some disturbance from the irrigation canal, uh, but there were undisturbed uh, features on the western half. And I now go through these two squares one by one, uh, starting with K9. Uh, in here, after documentation, we decided to lift the uppermost level of the walls. Of course, we expect that we have four meters of stratigraphy to go. And what we found was mostly the foundations underneath. It's interesting to see that some walls, like the one you can maybe recognize here, have a sort of lower bedding made with very, very small um, stones, whereas other walls are right right away uh, constructed from larger stones and there's probably to be expected that there was either rammed earth or some mud brick like material on top um, when cleaning all this although in many areas the floors uh, were not preserved because we are already at the level of the foundation there are some uh, some areas like here in the northwestern corner where we can see the residues of working areas. In here, we have a big collection of um, flint cores. So probably a sort of cache uh, of uh, raw material to be prepared further. And we have other such detail observations. Uh, square number K10 is even more complex and where Michela Hodger's team left last year, just on the upper edge of the flint napping place, this is where we took over. And what you can see on the left is the mapping of all the features that were documented this year underneath. And all in blue, I just go one further, all in blue um, are pieces of the, that belong to this workshop. Um, the debris of this workshop very clearly overlay a building, the corner of a building that is here called House 3, of which we have so far um, documented just two rooms. And we are just at the very upper level where this house became visible. So we did not go yet into the rooms. And then there is a third structure that may appear a bit enigmatic. And this is a structure consisting of post holes arranged in a half circle. And I will show you uh, these three features one by one. Probably the semicircular uh, structure is contemporary with the houses, but definitely um, the napping place is not. So taking a look at this napping place, we have a total here of um, more than, it's slightly more than 4,000 
individual flints that we measured one by one once they reached a size of at least one centimeter. So there's more in total. Uh, it's around uh, 30 kilograms of material. And you see here below uh, the table where first steps of pre-sorting according to material and to types um, uh, to, to, to the stage of debitage are taking place. There are at least two separate layers of, um, of this um, napping place. So two phases of throwing debris into this area, as you can see from the plot on the lower left. And because parts of the snapping place are still standing or are still kept in the profile, we look forward to going back next year and complete this task. The house underneath that you can best see really in the aerial photograph um, has walls that are made from rammed earth or pise. So they are extremely difficult to see. Um, it helps if, uh, if we redden the soil and you can just see better the corners of this upper room up here. And you see appearing down here, a second room where we are just at the top level of what is preserved of this wall. And there is a fireplace here that is located underneath um, the later napping place. So a very fine and very detailed stratigraphy building up here. And as the third structure that is interesting to introduce, we have here um, a semicircle of post holes. And no, this is not mouse dens or anything. This is real post holes. They have a, a, a sort of funnel shaped um, structure and they are organized in a fairly regular way. And we think that this is probably the support for a roof or for a whatever kind of shelter, potentially leaning towards this building. So what we learn from this is that Gürtje Tepe 3, um, and this is to be expected with the lower levels as well, will show us a highly condensed uh, stratigraphy so this is rather complex to excavate. Uh, we know, as Mujella Hoja just said, that the upper occupation um, is really the last occupation phase. And this is also the last phase when these huge sites of the PPN existed. So we are just running up towards the moment when the big sites are being abandoned. From the material culture that uh, Mujella Hoja has shown, we can very well compare um, Gürtel Tepe to Sabi Abiyat II, further down the Balich Valley, to Mesra Telleilat, to Halula on the Euphrates, but also to the big site of Bukras. And all these sites are exceptionally large sites. And from that moment onward, we have, uh, we expect a gap in the archaeological record that we have not yet understood. So one of the really important questions will be why, why these huge sites are being abandoned towards the end of the PPNB. And Gürtel Tepe 3, what's preserved of it, is a perfect site to investigate these questions by really carefully documenting throughout the stratigraphy what changes in um, the records of animal bones, of plants, of anything that can give us a hint at what happened. Do we have, where do changes come from that motivate the abandonment of these sites? So the future rationale of research will be to focus on the reasons for this abandonment. And I wanna conclude by thanking lots of people listed on and institutions listed on the right, starting with Genel Midulik, Shanlu Orfa Museum, Shanlu Orfa Municipality, and in particular, Tash Tepeler project and Nechmi Karu. And then, of course, the team that made it all possible, the villagers that worked with us, um, all those are to be thanked. And thank you. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.